You have to understand the war on drugs has never been about drugs. America's public enemy number one is drug abuse. What will you do when someone offers you drugs? <laughs> We intend to end the drug menace and to eliminate this dark, evil enemy within. Put him away. Put him away where they Three belong. Three strikes and you are out. Somebody down the road said drugs are bad. Okay, there's no argument there. But think about where we are 30 years later. I do what I have to do. I know how to survive. Yeah, I got some weed, too. Don't let them run. Against drugs is heating up. I think they should have wrote prison guard on my forehead when I was born because it just fits me. I say he's a criminal. Let him go to prison. I have a life and 30 year sentence. 20 years for drug trafficking. I have life without parole for three ounces of methamphetamine. Of the 2,600 people I've sent to federal prison, I've seen three or four kingpins. We're incarcerated poor people who are drug addicts. You're watching poor, uneducated people be fed into a machine like meat to make sausage. Law enforcement agencies get rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of drug arrests. My money's ours now. That's my money now. The scale is unbelievable. Nobody gels their population at the rate that we do. All sorts of people get a financial interest. Taser gun manufacturers, health care providers, phone companies. You build a bed, they fill the bed. And you'll get rich, and we'll get rich, and we'll all be rich together. in a great experiment. What happens when you take large numbers of people, remove them from their neighborhoods, their families? What y'all getting them for? What does this do to the broader community? The drug war is a holocaust in slow motion. This is a war on all Americans. I think people keep saying, well, that's about them. Well, no, it's about you. My name is Eugene Jarecki. I'm the director of a new film called The House I Live In. I was joined today, and I'm very proud of it, by Danny Glover, the legendary actor and also fighter for civil rights, who is an executive producer on my film, which is another thing I'm very proud of. Danny works tirelessly around this country to shed light uh, for people uh, uh, on issues of injustice, uh, economic inequality, uh, social justice broadly, and he's applied himself tirelessly to my film to get the message about the American drug war out to people uh, in a way that um, he did today. He spoke to young people today in a way that is really special to him. You know, he's both a very a, a keenly smart observer of American life and of how America works, but he's also a person with skin in the game himself, with family members incarcerated. He's a grandfather. He talked about his grandson today and the struggles that his grandson is having as a third grader with some of the very same forces that ultimately lead young people uh, to find themselves feeling lost and compromised on the streets and, and uh, without proper parenting without proper uh, community, without the forces that shape the young person. And so too many people find themselves going down that slippery slope of drug use, drug sale, and then before long they're involved in the criminal justice system. And as I mentioned today, it makes you a slave. It makes you a slave to forces that you don't control. You stop being master of your own destiny and you, you enter that world through a drug and you find your way down a very slippery slope into use, sale, incarceration, involvement with the cops. And Danny talked about that from his own first-hand experience. The Proctor Conference has been invaluable to getting my movie and its message about American injustice out across the country to churches, to schools, like today, like tomorrow, where we're at Shiloh Baptist Church here in Washington, organized by Dr. Iva Carruthers and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. Iva Carruthers is a force of nature. She's one of the best people living in America. I would call her a national treasure. Every time I talk to her, some great thing comes out of that conversation because Iva is full of ideas and full of follow through. You don't come up with anything in a phone call with Iva that doesn't happen a week later and not only happen but happen with great glory and great commitment and with every every T crossed and every I dotted so I have a huge amount of admiration for Iva and for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference without whom we wouldn't be at Shiloh Baptist Church tomorrow we wouldn't be here at Ballou High School and in hundreds of other high schools and hundreds of other churches uh, today and tomorrow and we also wouldn't have been at Ebenezer Baptist Church last Saturday 
where I had the honor to speak in the same church where Martin Luther King spoke, um, which was a life honor for me, a, a, a dream uh, opportunity made possible by Iva Crothers and the Samuel Twin Proctor Conference, who have just worked tirelessly, free of charge, to just make this film available to people around this country so that the conversation can really get started to reform this system. And the war on drugs has never been about drugs. U.S. Customs Officers and police are having another drive to round up dope smugglers. Here's millions of dollars worth of deadly heroin, enough, they say, to kill six million people. Looking to find out more about the longer history of drugs in America, I found an unlikely source in Lincoln historian Richard Miller. His research put drug laws in a fascinating historical context. Historically, anti-drug laws have always been associated with race. In the 1800s, certain kinds of drugs that are illicit today were common in this country. Cocaine was widely used, heroin. People using drugs, it was something that was just ordinarily accepted. Opium, for example, was used by middle-aged successful whites, often housewives in the South. If people were addicted or abusing drugs, they were viewed sympathetically as people who had to be helped. It was seen as a public health issue rather than a crime issue. Well, one of the first changes was on the West Coast when the smoking opium was made a criminal offense. Now, why would opium smoking be illegal in California but not in Mississippi? What was going on in California that was a concern about smoking opium? Well, as it turns out, it had nothing to do with opium itself. The concern was with the people associated with smoking opium, and that was the Chinese who had come to this country, and many of whom were in California, working hard, working for very little pay, and becoming part of the American success story. But their success was taking jobs away from white workers. So politicians got together and decided they gotta find something about the Chinese for which they can be criminalized to get them out of the way. Now, of course, you can't throw people in jail simply because they're Chinese but you can throw them in jail because they smoke opium. In the same way, we saw things going on with cocaine. Again, it was middle-aged, successful people in this country, business executives, physicians, housewives, all perfectly legal. But then around the turn of the century, cocaine began being associated with blacks. They could withstand police bullets, it was thought. They can work hard all day, all night long, and all day long again, threatening the jobs of white workers. And so laws began to be passed against cocaine. You're not arresting these people officially because they're black. You're arresting them because they've committed some sort of drug violation. Next, of course, we see the change in reputation that hemp has had. Hemp was a legitimate crop from colonial times forward, a widely appreciated commercial product. But then in the 1930s, hemp changed into something vicious and fearsome called marijuana because at that time, marijuana smoking was being associated with Mexicans, working hard, working cheap. And once again, what was being outlawed was not being Mexican, but just some habit associated with Mexicans. These laws set up a very dangerous precedent of racial control. While following the steps that so many Americans take through the world of the drug war, I couldn't help but notice that at every stage, black Americans were disproportionately represented. You know, in any war, you've got to have an enemy. And when you think about the impact, particularly on poor people of color, there are more African Americans under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. And that's something we haven't been willing to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what's really going on? As it turns out, nearly everyone I talked to knew all about the impact of the drug war on black America. There's no question that the criminal laws impact disproportionately on poor and minorities. Certainly disproportionate number of black people are prosecuted. Yet while people could tell me all about their firsthand experience of this, very few had any idea where it came from. <laughs> 